So the first question is, where do you work? I work as a school administrator for the Garth Fagan Dance School, but I also handle the marketing for Garth Fagan Dance. That's awesome. And for those who don't know, who is Garth Fagan? Garth Fagan is the choreographer and artistic director and founder of Garth Fagan Dance, and it is located in Rochester, New York. The company is a contemporary dance company, and the dance is pretty unique for it focuses around the Fagan technique, but you may also recognize Garth for he is the choreographer of The Lion King. That's so cool. <laughs> and I know that you created the program Dance to Be. Can you talk a little bit about that and what inspired you to create such a program? Sure. Dance to Be is an after school program in collaboration with the Boys and Girls Club and Center for Youth. The program is offered towards Rochester City School students, so they're able to take dance classes from the company dancers. So the students learn from the dancers who perform on stage. The program was created in order to have students to have a safe space, to have a creative environment, and also offering enrichment classes like yoga and nutrition classes. It started off with first and second graders, and then we have grown into the middle school age. So great. And what are your main responsibilities? As a school administrator, I run the Dance to Be program, but I also run the community classes as part of the Garth Fagan Dance School. All the classes focus on the Fagan technique. So students who are three years old to adults learn this technique all year round. And I also run a summer intensive program around July. And on the flip side of things, I also handle the marketing for the company. So anything from branding, from touring, performances, all that fun stuff. <laughs> and how did you become interested in this field specifically? As a child, I was always a creative one, always tinkering and making something. Before I ended up in Garfagan Dance, I was in the market research world, focused on consumer behavior. I always wanted to channel my creative side. And when I saw the opportunity to work for Garth and for his company, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to harness my creative side. I really appreciate that, your creativity. <laughs> and what do you like most about your position? It's definitely a place where it's a collaborative space. Anyone from the administration to the dancers has a creative bone. And it's cool how we all vibe on each other's energy and ricochet off ideas to create something in the studio. Yeah, I'll bring something to the table. What is your most proud moment on the job? I will never forget, we were on tour in New York City and we were at the Joyce Theater. And the Joyce Theater is known for the theater for dance, very respected theater. And we were on tour for Garth's new work. Um, and it was a world premiere as well. And so it was a week long run. And anything with touring and performances, it gets pretty crazy. You're running around the city, you're running around the theater, you're working with people at the theater to make sure everything runs smoothly. And we were at the last performance, the last one for the run, ready to pack up and leave and go back to Rochester. And Garth came up to me and he just gave me the biggest hug. And he said, you did an amazing job, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And at that moment, I felt like I was on top of the world because you're always just focused on every single detail to make sure that his world premiere goes out with a bang. And so the fact that he recognized my work and saw what I was doing, I felt that all that running around the city and just pulling odd strings and ends really did pay off. Yeah, how nice. And what are some challenges that you face on the job? Definitely self-care in the nonprofit industry. It's great that I get to work in the community and for the community. And as much as I'm helping others, sometimes you forget to take a step back and tell yourself it's okay to have a moment for yourself because burnout is a thing. And so it's always this inner challenge within yourself to find the right balance to protect your light. And what are some ways that you practice self-care while you're on this busy job? <laughs> um, I actually like to paint. Oh, I started painting because I attended First Fridays 
and I met this artist and I loved her work and she said oh I offer paint classes and I showed her what I do just on Photoshop and Adobe and I thought I don't think I can actually do that and she's like no anyone can do painting and art and so I took her classes and found out you know I'm actually pretty good at this I'm no Picasso or anything but it's definitely a space where I call my own and I can just let out all my emotions and just be free <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. Finding that self-care time is super hard, especially as a student, too, trying to schedule it in and things like that. So, um, What are some skills that you've gained from your education at Nazareth that has prepared you for this role? There are many, uh, one of which is budgeting and accounting management. So for example, for the after school program I run, it is grant funded. So I'm always thinking with this grant, how do I allocate that money in every part of the program? Am I overspending? Am I underspending? When it comes to the community classes, I'm always doing the accounting every semester to make sure how much are we making? How much are we losing? And then taking that data and looking back on past semesters because I want us to constantly grow and see where the areas that we need to improve on. Um, another important skill I find is storytelling. In marketing, storytelling is very important. So for me in my position, working for Garth, majority of people know him as this choreographer for, for The Lion King. When that's just a part of his story, the other pages to his story is the fact that he has his own dance company, which is going on for 50 years now. The fact that he has created his own dance technique, which is up there with the Martha Graham technique as well. And so those parts of his story, some people don't know or haven't been told. So I'm always crafting ways of bridging the gap. Yeah. And who are some of your biggest influences, both at Nazareth and outside of Naz, that have helped you get where you are today? While I was at NAS, my biggest influence and mentor was Stella Putino Calabrese. At the time, she was a Casa Italiana director, and she was a very popular Italian professor. I worked for her at the Casa my junior and senior year as her student assistant, and she taught me a valuable lesson in leadership. That leadership isn't about being in charge, it's about taking care of those who are in charge. So whoever worked at the CASA, she wanted you to thrive in your position. So no matter if you were a tutor or if you were a student assistant like me, or you're teaching a class, she wanted you to succeed. So she always went out of her way to figure out, do you have the right materials for your class? Do you have everything at your disposal? And I thought this is a lesson that you really can't learn out of a textbook. But then also when it comes to outside of Nazareth, my biggest influence is definitely my parents and my grandparents. I am a child of immigrant parents and my parents really worked hard to give me everything that they didn't have and the opportunities they didn't have. And sometimes I feel guilty that they work so hard for me and all I can do is do the same in return. So I always think of it as I work hard because they were the originals at it. Yeah, what a great thought. <laughs> So what was your area of study at Nazareth and how do you connect your major with your current job position? We talked a little bit about marketing, but you can expand on that. Well, I was a marketing major and my major really taught me about duty to my community. I will never forget the time I took one of Dr. Lee's classes and on, Dr. Lee is actually a professor in management in the School of Business. And we collaborated with the community place and the director there was offering this after school program and one of the classes was STEM. And so he wanted to add part of the STEM project either to expand it more or with the current class, add something to it. So all of us broke up in groups, we were assigned different topics and we had to figure out different paths of how do we keep students engaged? What are creative ways to bring students into the program? And it's funny how you fast forward time and now the roles are reversed and now I'm the one who's standing there saying okay I have this program what are the facets can I bring into it who am I able to collaborate with what do students like what keeps them engaged so I'm very thankful for that experience yeah that's crazy how much it connects to your job yeah <laughs> full circle moment yes from your job at Garth Fagan, um, I know you run a blog, 
So would you be able to tell me a little bit about how it ties to the importance of your heritage? I have a blog called Lola Jamie, and it actually stems from the fact that my family is from the Philippines. So Lola in the Filipino language means grandmother. Jamie is my grandmother's last name. So I created it in a sense of a pseudo name, but honoring my grandmother. And in my family, my grandmother was the one who cooked at family parties. And I mean, it was like a spread of food on the table, like to the point, you better figure out where do you sit and stand so you can call dibs on what you want first. And so <laughs> she taught me the art of cooking and she taught me cooking and loving to cook. And so through her, I learned that cooking shows love. It shows to bring people to the table. It is a language of its own. And I was actually given my grandmother's recipe book from my aunt and my mom. And I remember my grandmother telling me that she was writing this family recipes on um, the recipes that she cooks for us and dishes that she grew up with. And she'd always tell, she would tell me, oh, the measurements are off. I would have to revise it. And she had this dream of publishing this book. Unfortunately, she passed before that dream ever came true. So when I received this book, I was thinking maybe I could cook out of it and revise it and maybe write something about it that. I can share with people because out of all people in my family, I'm actually the only one who knows the recipes. She was the only one who taught them to me. So yeah. it feels like I have this golden key that can unlock this book's potential. And as I was cooking and revising it, I didn't even realize that the Philippines is an archipelago. So there's 7,000 islands with all different dialects. I mean, there's 90 different languages and dialects spoken in the Philippines. And on top of that, different di dishes and cuisines that are specific to each region. And my grandmother had a very extensive knowledge of that. So I'm thinking I need to learn these different cuisines and these different dishes in order to revise her recipe book. So now as much as I'm revising it, I'm actually cooking out of other Filipino chefs cookbook to learn the different techniques and the history of the dishes because all these dishes are a melting pot that pulls from other different Asian cultures as well. So currently right now I'm cooking out of Alvin Kalin's cookbook called Amboy. Um, he actually runs a YouTube channel, very popular called The Burger Show. And so I'm learning a lot about different cuts of meat and understanding how to marinate and the importance of it. It's very fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I love your idea of like the golden key, like this responsibility to make all these recipes and make them to their fullest potential and things like that. Do you have a favorite recipe that you make um, that is either your grandma's or things that you're learning um, from these different Filipino chefs and things like that? I have a lot of favorite ones from her. She actually used to pack me food going back to school. So um, one of my favorite ones is Balenciana, which is very similar to the Spanish paella. The, the difference is that it's rice based, but it's glutinous rice, so or like a sticky rice. Um, and in the Philippines, it's considered like where we're from, it's kind of like a poor man's dish because you're throwing in different types of seafood and chicken and meat, but it tastes delicious. And it's one of those things that like you can eat, like you can make easily and it's quick and it just fills you up. Yeah. Other ones, I like the ones that are noodle based, which is bonset, and there's different types of noodles. And I like that too, because you can just like toss it together. And like, and it, that also roots to from like Panse Canton, which also roots towards like the Chinese side of it all with the noodles and keeping it long. And, you know, you're supposed to like not like bite the noodles off because it's like saying that's like bad luck type thing. Wow, <laughs> I didn't history. know that. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of history that stems from it all. So it's crazy how like growing up, I saw it's just this one way of it all. And now I'm seeing it as there's different parts of it. There's Chinese involved. There's a little bit of Indian in it as well. So, and a little tiny bit of Mal Malaysian in there. So it's, everything is like a Pandora's box right now for me. <laughs> yeah, finding all these influences and making those connections. Um, so my next question is, currently in our world, the AAPI community is specifically facing discrimination. Can you describe how you have used your art form to voice your message of change? really to educate I want people to be open-minded and see the Filipino culture and love it as much as I do and yeah. I think the best way to do it is through food because everyone who doesn't want to eat food who doesn't want to yeah. pass a plate yeah <laughs> so, 
Um, so that's how I was thinking as I think of it as more of let's create a healthy dial or a healthy conversation. Let's ask questions. Let's break the stigmas and the stereotypes of, you know, being Filipino or just being Asians in general. And I'm just doing just like what my grandmother did. Like she just brought everyone to the table. So if she can do it, I can do it. I love that. Yeah. And what would you say some of your goals are for your f- future or things you have on your bucket list? Um, we did talk about this before. I do have one of my goals written on the tunnel walls. I hope it's still there. I have one of them. And um, just backstory on it. The last day of my senior year, the last day of classes, a friend of mine, we went to the tunnels and there was a section on the tunnel walls that says, when I fly NAS. And as seniors, you get to write your goals of what you want to do when you graduated. And I wrote to travel the world and make a difference. I can confidently say since graduating, I've traveled to different parts of the U.S., even abroad and doing what I'm doing as a career. I'm definitely living out that goal. Um, another goal I have is I do want to publish my grandmother's cookbook one day. I'll maybe make it into a cookbook biography type book. Yeah. Um, I also have a dream of maybe one day having my own Filipino fusion restaurant or like a food truck. So you never know what's going to happen. So you better keep your eyes peeled for that. <laughs> I can't wait to see. <laughs> What advice would you give to a current member of the Nazareth community that might be unsure of their major or career path? It isn't abnormal to feel unsure of what major you want to go in, but just don't be afraid to explore. So if you're declared or undeclared, I really do suggest to look into clubs and organizations on campus. Even if you're major, if even if you're a declared major, and you like a club and it has nothing to do with your major, but you're purely interested in it, go join it. And actually, you'll never know that club could actually weave into your major in some way, shape, or form. Um, If you're undeclared, you never know that that club organization can be the stepping stone to finding your own major. So don't be afraid to explore. Um, I also highly suggest to have a mentor. I'm very fortunate and blessed that during my time at Nazareth, I had Stella who, you know, kind of weave me during my career at, my, at Nazareth. And so you can find your mentor at work or maybe at an internship, or you can also use Flyer Connect. Um, there's a bunch of NAS alum who are on there who are willing to talk to you about their time at Nazareth and their careers now and maybe even their passion projects. So if you're interested in the arts or you're interested in a nonprofit or you just want to talk about food, I'm on I'm on Flyer Connect. So feel free to reach out to me and like we can talk about food all day. I love <laughs> to talk to the Golden Flyers. <laughs> I just really love your story, how you used marketing as a foundation to build upon everything that you love, you know, your food, the food, the heritage, your family, um, giving back to everyone. So I just think that's a really good response to that question in the sense of you used everything that you love with your foundation at NAS. So, so cool. Everything stems off from a passion. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you.